What's up, guys? Welcome back to The Creative Truth. I'm Raz, your stand-in host for Tyler. This week, I am playing a never-before-released interview I did a year ago with a brother by the name of Donovan Livingston. He is really cool dude. I'll do the full intro in the in the episode. But I did it for a podcast I was doing called The Razcast, a little brainchild of mine that developed from the Savannah Business Showcase, my first podcast in Savannah. And it, uh, anyway, 2021 has been a very hectic year, especially after moving from Savannah, North Carolina. My life's just been kind of all over the place. So I never released it. So first of all, Donovan, I'm sorry for not releasing it sooner. Thank you for sharing your time with me a year ago and your story and your, your insight and all the topics we talked about. I really appreciate that. I still appreciate that. And I hope that this podcast gets a ton of views just so that you can, you know, spread your your message a little bit more. So thank you for that. Thank you guys for listening. I'll do the full interview and the thing. I'm going to leave all his links in the description to get his album, to get his his books, his hear his poetry, to see his uh, viral video at Harvard. So, yeah, just uh, check him out. Yeah, so thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Raz Cast. I am Raz, and I have a very special guest here with me today, uh, Mr. Donovan Livingston. Uh, we went to yeah, school. was good. Yeah, with, with yes, both sir. of my heels. Uh, Go heels, man. <laughs> that's, <laughs> no, that's why I'm ready to come back to North Carolina, too, man. I want to, like, tailgating sure. or something. Uh, hey man, we here for you. You just gotta keep your distance, but we here for you though, dog. <laughs> <laughs> That's real. All right, for so sure. you got a, a couple projects out. You you've done some really cool things, so I'm ready to get into it. But I always start the show with a scenario. Um, you walk you're walking through your neighborhood, a little kid comes up to you and says, Donovan, you're my hero. Uh, I want to be like you when I grow up. Uh it could, you know, and you know, so in the language that a 10 or a 12 year old can understand, what does it take to be Donovan Livingston? Mm. What does it take to be Donovan Livingston? I think it takes a commitment to being yourself um, in spite of what other people might tell you, um, that the ideas you have, the voice you speak with, the way you talk, the way you carry yourself is enough. And whatever space you walk into, just know that you belong. You always have and you always will. Mm. Straight do up. You, do you ever feel like that? You ever feel like you don't belong when you walk into spaces? Man, all the time, bro. <laughs> all the time. Which is why, which is why I would tell a 10-year-old, like, don't be that person, man. Like you spend, you, you know, when you reflect and look back, you realize like as you navigate these institutions of power and privilege as a black man or someone of a marginalized identity, um, you have to have these constant conversations with yourself um, um, that you do belong, that you do matter. And it goes back to Du Bois and, and that sense of double consciousness, right? It's like, it's not enough that I just be good at my job, but it's like, I'm hyper aware of myself um, as a black man in space at all times. And so I would much rather I not feel like I don't belong. I'd much rather walk in a room knowing I own it. But I yeah. think because I've spent so much of my life, like trying to overcome that, um, that it just becomes, uh, you know, deeply entrenched in who you are. And so, mm -hmm those constant reminders, those little affirmations you have to tell yourself um, could be the, the the thing that spells the difference between life and death in some moments, man. So yeah, yeah. You gotta, I, you gotta remind yourself. Yeah. I mean, I felt like that in the past, definitely, definitely Carolina, you know, but more so, I guess more so not, not that I'm thinking back on it, like not so much that I was a, a black guy, but that I just felt like, you know, I just didn't fit in. And, you know, I don't know yeah. if it was because I was black or not, but like, how do you, but I know a lot of I know a lot of people feel like that. So like, how do you overcome that? How do you overcome that? I mean, I mean, it starts with like acknowledging that there is a culture that exists. So being aware that there is something here that might be unspoken or unseen, but you know it it exists. Like when you go to a school like Carolina that's predicated on sports culture, right? And in big schools with cult like followings, like you realize that before you even set foot on campus, before you even open an acceptance letter and decide to go, right? Yeah. And when you get there, you bring all of that with you, whether you know it or not. And then mm -hmm. when you start to see what people mean when they sing the fight song or wear the school colors, and you start to see who's reflected when people chant those things or cheer those things, and you realize that's not you, 
um, you have like this, not an identity crisis, but you start to think about like, wow, none of this was actually built for me. It was built by me. It was built by people like me, by my ancestors, blood, sweat, and tears, right? Yeah. But this wasn't designed with me in mind. And so, although I belong here, although the admissions office, right, it says I belong, um, you have to do that self-work um, on the back end to remind yourself each day that you can't have a p place here. And it comes with finding that community that makes you feel like a whole person. And sometimes that, that takes a little bit longer uh, for some of us than others, yeah. for sure. Yeah, no doubt about that. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I, like as <laughs> moving to Savannah uh, mm -hmm. four, four years ago, being around this uh, super red state, uh, I have, I'm like, <laughs> you don't say. Yeah. <laughs> Georgia. And especially, so Savannah's not really super red. It's more like blue. You know, it's more liberal. But yeah, I mean, yeah, outskirts yeah. is like all, it's like, it's super conservative. And oh, I'm, trust me. I've been keeping up with Georgia on the news, bro. <laughs> yeah, Georgia's crazy right now. <laughs> Brian Kemp got y'all on. You know what? Never mind. I'm going to chill. I'm going to chill. But I feel you, though. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I guess I was going to say also is that, man, like I've become actually more like libertarian, conservative myself. Like just seeing people who, you know, vote red, who should like, so here's the scenario. Like I first moved down mm -hmm. here, uh, 2016, right before mm -hmm. the election, Trump signs went up everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I was like, I was like, wow, I'm real. surrounded by like a bunch of racist people. Uh, but like when I talk to people, they're not racist, they're really good people. Mm -hmm. So, so I've become more conservative thinking like, why are these people who I know are smart? Cause I've talked to them and communicate with them who I know mm -hmm. aren't the portrayed as the, the idiots, uh, Southerners, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, yeah, yeah. so it, it's been kind of an awakening in a little bit to become more libertarian. So it's mm -hmm. like, so I, I just do a lot of thinking back, like why, why was Carolina so hard for me? You know what I'm saying? All this stuff, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, do, well, do, you yeah, know, I, I think, I think bro, you speak to something that's really powerful in that, uh, uh, we don't give ourselves permission to change our minds. Right. Um, a lot of times we think uh, the way we were born and raised, um, that those ideas were our, our law and truth. Um, and we don't often give our, uh, ourselves grace in challenging those ideals as we get older, right? And so, and then on top of that, we are raised in a society where you're led to believe that your way of thinking is right and only your way of thinking yeah. is right, right? Yeah. So that way, that's why when you see these other um, opposing political candidate signs in people's yards, you get offended because it's like, yo, not only is this person against what I have to say, think and feel, they're against me as a whole person. Right. And that's, you know, that's a reflection of like how, this is a reflection of how media sort of paints these, um, this binary between red and blue, good and right, good, you know, Black and white, left yeah. and right. Yeah, exactly. And so it's always been deeper than that. But Again, we don't live in a society that allows us um, the uh, the gift of subtlety and nuance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. about that a whole lot. A whole yeah, lot. man. And, and I was I was also like inspired by your your speech at Harvard, man. Like how crazy. Was I appreciate that? it. Thank yeah, you man. That. Yeah, no. I, I, you know, let's talk about um, perspective. Like I just you know was looking. out, I was blessed with the opportunity to represent my class uh, to in doing the convocation address. I had to audition actually. And what's wild is, bro, like I didn't even have that speech finished. It wasn't finished when I auditioned. I might have had like a stanza or two. And yeah. so when I walked in, like um, I made it through the first round um, of um, of auditions. Like the speech itself, the written version, made it through the first round. I was like, all right, bet, cool, I'm in there. And then I got stricken with like inspiration. I was like, let me write some extra, a little extra, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I walked in there, I spit one poem. And I was like, I like that, but I got this new thing I'm kind of working on. If y'all give me a chance to, I'd like to see, see, see how you feel about it. And I spit those two stanzas and um, I just walked out. They didn't make no faces, it was like blank stares the whole time. Like, oh snap, I just messed up. I blew, blew the money, <laughs> bruh, blew the money. And, um, you know, a few days later, I get um, that congratulations email in my inbox. And I was like, oh, snap. But in the same breath, I was like, oh, snap. Like, I really got to actually, yeah. I, now I got to do it. So, you know, I just wrote like crazy, man. But um, I'm really grateful um, I had a chance to do that. When you talk about uh, yeah. reclaiming space mm -hmm. uh, in it, within institutions, again, that weren't historically designed for you, um, me being able to do a spoken word poem at my graduation at an institution like Harvard was uh, was uh, not just life-changing for me, but I think it gave folks who also see the world 
through a lyrical lens, a chance to see themselves reflected on a, on on that stage too. So I'm really grateful for that, bro. Mm. Appreciate it. It's hard to believe that was four years ago, but it's, yeah, I, yeah. I, looked, I looked, watched it last night again. I was like, wow, those. I uh, appreciate it, right bro. Here. It was yeah, uh, man. And I even saw your book, Lift Off. I saw it in like a bookstore down here in Savannah. I was like, what? <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, man. <laughs> that, hey, bro, that never that never gets old, man. Like people, I, I don't know, man. He, I just remember sitting in my dorm room, right, just or or uh, on the basketball courts at Hinton James in the dorms, like yeah. just writing, bro. Like I don't know what I'm writing for or what I'm writing to, but I knew I was writing my way into something. And so, you know, to to that ten year old you mentioned in the beginning, bro, like that's what I mean by committing to yourself and your voice. Like, don't ever turn your eye away from the thing that gives you life. And those lyrics always gave me life, man. And mm. I don't know, I'm just, just grateful to, to, to be able to have moments like that. Share with folks like you, homies from, from way back and uh, create new communities too in the process, man. Yeah, yeah. So, so who's your inspiration then? Like, and also like, like, don't never turn your back on stuff that gives you life. I love that. But like, yeah, who, man. Um, like who, who's your inspiration? I see KRS-One in the background. Oh you know yeah, man. That's a, <laughs> that's, um, I mean, like, uh, people that I know are more of my inspirations than some of the, like, you know, I, I, I listen to artists and I, I, I value the, the old heads, the OGs who like laid the foundation for hip hop to be what it is. Um, but honestly, bro, I'm just a simple dude, like who looks to people in his life as the, the, the catalyst for inspiration. And so obviously my partner, uh, Lauren, she keeps me going. Uh, she challenges me in ways that I didn't know I needed to be challenged. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, I don't know. She's an MD, PhD student. She's a mom. She's uh, an author. She's all of these things. And I'm like, how do you find time in the day to do to, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? To, to work yeah. through such a lengthy list of, of identities and, and things that make you, um, that make you move and think and move. And so I'm just grateful for her so that, I mean, inspiration starts starts and ends there but yeah. you know again i find inspiration in the strangest of places on um, walks with mm -hmm. the dogs um when i look at joy like there's just always something mm -hmm. there's always something to be working toward and feel good about i mean you know wh who inspires you man you know yeah uh who do i mean I, I second it you know my wife seeing how hard she works you know she's a she's a pharmacist so that's a yeah, yeah. D farm D as well she's a uh, yeah she's a mom of three kids had the kids while going to school she got a just recently went back and got a MBA, got a 4.0. Let's go. Yeah, so man, killing it. It sounds like home, it's probably home putting a new roof on right now. Yeah, that's that. real, bro. I mean, and, oh, and Lauren, Lauren Bill stuff too, bro. It sounds like black women are inspiration. That's, yeah. I mean, yeah, let's my, just, my wife's yeah. white, but I got you. Oh, my bad. But, 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 you, but you, but you feel me though. You feel yeah. me though. <laughs> yeah, I feel yeah, you. Yeah, I know exactly yeah. what you mean. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah, okay. All right, cool, man. So, so tell me about, uh, for, well, first, and then we'll get into molasses, but like, do you consider yourself a poet, a spoken word artist, or do you consider yourself a rapper? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, all three, bro. Like, I don't know, I, I, I think um, we do ourselves a disservice when we try to distinguish between everything. I view rappers as poets, I view um, poets as, as, as capable of, of making great music. And I think uh, for me, um, I spent so much time early on trying to say, I want to be a rapper and a poet or one or the other, or um, my parents, when I was growing up, always made the, tried to make me make that distinction because they didn't want me to rap, right? Uh, because of what rap might have been, because of what rap music is often associated with. And I think uh, I, I resented the identity of poet for a very long time. And so I got to college and saw that that identity was something that, that could be validated. You know what I mean? So. Mm -hmm. I think, I think each embracing each of those gives you a, a a space to create worlds, and I see language as a way to create create worlds, to create communities, to create a reality that you hope to hope to exist. And so, I see each of those identities that you mentioned um, as being instrumental in creating those those realities. Mm, mm. Yeah, man. Yeah, it, yeah. People want to put you in a box, so I, I guess that's why I asked the question. But I figured you'd say something like that. You know what I'm <laughs> My fault, man. <laughs> nah, you good. No. <laughs> Typical nah. poet response, yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> nah, My fault, bro. No, no, no. That's good because, you know, we are multifaceted people. You know what yeah. I mean? And, like, nobody's just one thing anymore. Like, everybody's an entrepreneur. Everybody's an artist. Everybody's a creative. Everybody's, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? You're, you're a dad. You're a husband. You're a son. You're a brother. 
you know, your frat brother. We we share mm-hmm. Cliff. Cliff is our mutual yeah, frat yeah. brother. Exactly, yeah. exactly, man. So it's like uh so it's like we are all this stuff together. So it's like when mm-hmm. you so I asked the question because it's a hard question, but you know, you answered it beautifully. But because we are all these things at one time. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. man. It's, it's the beauty of intersectionality, right? Nobody's any one thing when they enter a space. Nobody sh- removes an identity just because they're at work. You don't lose, you know, uh, um, one of those ways of being just because you're on a podcast, right? Like you, you embody all of those things in everywhere you go. And it's how can you, how can you shape the world you're in um, through your actions, through your language, through your thoughts and ideas? Um, and how are those thoughts, language, actions, ideas celebrated within the spaces that you inhabit? Mm-hmm. And if you can use your gifts in a way that, that uh, inspire other people to um, make changes necessary to, to, to change themselves in the world, then by all means, use those gifts in that way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, thinking back to like college, man, like I remember like seeing you walk around campus, like, so we were friends, we were cordial, <laughs> but we, we never really hung out, hung out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were definitely cordial. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What? But like I always remember, like you just seeing, like you always brought a good energy to your space. Where I was goofy, bro. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was too. Goofy. You know, what I'm, saying? <laughs> I'm still goofy. So yeah, it is man. What it is. Yeah. But, like, but you always brought that good energy, man. So it's like, what do you tell the kids you work with now, who are who don't feel like they belong, but who feel like they know a college education is right for them, but they don't feel like they belong at some of these schools mm. you work at. So like, well, what, what do you, I, how do you advise these kids? Yeah. Um, so I mean. You know, it depends on when I'm working with the student. So mm-hmm. I spent time in K through 12 settings and higher ed. If I'm working with the student on the K through 12 and we work really hard to help them find the college that's going to be the best fit. Mm-hmm. So oftentimes, um, you know, it's a matter of have, helping them ask the tough questions of admissions counselors, colleges, and universities. Is it, you know, if we go on a college tour, I, try, I tell them, don't let this school off the hook. If there's a hard question that you need the answer to, by all means, ask it. And by hard questions, I mean, I'm um, asking que- for, for my, my young women, especially, um, who are trying to find a school, ask them about, if you're nervous about issues as they relate to rape or sexual assault, like ask those questions on your campus tour so you have a better sense of what to expect and how the community uh, holds itself accountable to issues like that. Um, especially um, with issues as it relates to race or my undocumented students um, being vocal about the ways in which these campuses sort of make them integrated or, or feel like they're a part of the community is incredibly important. Uh, on the other side, right, when I'm working with students who have made the choice of where they want to go to school and they're currently enrolled, um, if they if they find themselves struggling, I always give them, um, I always try to point them in a direction of like finding organizations that fill certain gaps in their life. So um, for instance, um, I always challenge them to find four different types of community. So okay. uh, a community that appeals to um, their type of self-care. So maybe that's an intramural group or a yoga club or something, right? Something that keeps you active. Um, I always tell them to find a community that helps them um, uh, improve up upon a perceived weakness. So maybe you struggle in, a, in math courses, right? Maybe it's finding tutors for these things or finding communities where you can get the support you need to improve. Um, also challenge students to find communities that reaffirm a dominant identity. So for me, uh, for instance, that was Black Student Movement. I was looking for a community within a community that made me feel seen at the university. Uh, that wasn't just, I knew Black folks who aren't a monolith like any race, right? But like, yeah. I also wanted to tap into that diversity within my own Blackness. And so mm-hmm. um, for me, that, that that's what that was. But helping students find an organization that reaffirms a dominant identity is important. And then finally, um, helping students find an identity, find a group that helps them express an identity that they want to express more openly. So for me, that was my poetry group that I was a part of. It's Mm -hmm. like I wrote a little bit. I had a couple bars when I was in high school, but I didn't have a a structure to sort of express that or a community to express that within. But I found that when I got to college. And so those things are different for different people. But if those four types of organizations really help students feel, I think, I think uh, it helps them feel more anchored in, um, and where they decided to further their education. Yeah. Did I know that was a long answer, my fault, man. No, you're good, you're good. Follow-up question, uh, do you think college is right for everybody and like, do you think it was right for you? Absolutely not. So, whoa, <laughs> hold on. College is not right for everybody at a particular time. It was right for me at the time I decided to go. Um, even though I struggled, it was still the right time for me. Um, had you asked me that question 10 years ago though, I'd have been, it'd have been, yes, college is for everybody. I was drinking the Kool-Aid, bro. Like, 
I was a college advisor. Like that's, that's mm-hmm. what I did. I bought into this idea that, um, that college was for everyone and everyone had a space and it can be what you want it to be. But, yeah. you know, a reality set in and I saw a number of my students like not finishing or dropping out or transferring or not persisting toward their degree, um, going into student loan debt and really, you know, not, not saying I set them up for failure. Right. Okay. But like yeah. having those honest conversations on the front end to help students understand the, uh, structural consequences that await them if they don't finish. Mm-hmm. Right. I think it's more important. We have this, I, students grow up in a society where like, it is perfunctory for them to go to college after high school. It's like right. we force feed it down their throats and, and we tell them like, this is the gold standard. And although that might be the gold standard for economic mobility, um, it is not always the gold standard for preserving your peace and sense of self. Um, you have to be ready um, academically, emotionally, financially. And um, as I've gotten older and become <laughs> deeper in this game, yeah. um, I've been more honest with students about, maybe you should take a gap year or maybe this, maybe it's not this type of college you want to go to right now. Maybe it's a community college or something else. And just seeing the value in different types of higher education is something that I've grown into a bit more um, as I, as I get deeper in this game. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that makes so much sense to me because I, I struggled at college. I came out, I had like a, I didn't even understand it. Like being the first person in my family, really, uh, Mm -hmm. except for one aunt. Uh, to go to college, you know, so yeah. I just didn't, I didn't know anything. I didn't know that, you know, the first year of courses are so important. I didn't know if you don't go to your class, you're really not going to pass. Come on, bro. You know what you what <laughs> All Come stuff. on, bro. We might have been the same person, man. Like, <laughs> I look back, I look back on my transcript as a barren wasteland of mediocrity. Like, I had <laughs> hey, I love it. no, no sense of what I was doing. I changed my major three times in like mm-hmm. the first month. Mm. right I dropped classes because I didn't like what time they started it was just it was bad man but I think um it goes back to you know what you what you said you were the first in your family to go to college I'm a Mm -hmm. second generation college student so my parents were first gen and it's like I grew up knowing college was going to be a part of my story or uh, or something like that but when I got there I was they had no way of preparing me for the experience of being at Carolina at that particular time. Right. Um, right. Especially, you know, you're just, probably, probably like me, like you probably just breezed through high school, you know? Yo, no, bro. No study. Eyes closed. No just, <laughs> right. just out here, you know how I live, bro. Leaving right. class to go run errands with teachers while I got a hundred on a test. Like I was chilling, man. And yeah. then you can't coast in undergrad, right? Mm-hmm. They're not going to let you take your foot off the gas. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I think, you say something else here too about like histories of like generational wealth and there's people that went to Carolina whose great, great, great uncles and granddads and whatever came through the institution. We just didn't have that, um, right. That like that sense of legacy uh, or entitlement to, to the experience we were having, which Mm -hmm. again, goes back to why you wrestle with ideas of belonging so much, just because you don't see reflections of you throughout the institution's history. Mm -hmm. You Mm -hmm. you do see buildings named after slaveholders, but that's another, maybe that's a conversation for another day, but (laughs) it's it's really, it's really hard to exist and not internalize those things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But at at some point, like, how do we get here's my question is like, how do we get over that? You know what I mean? Like at mm-hmm. some point there's gotta be a healing in this country, you know, mm-hmm. because I really don't want my kids and my grandkids to have to go through all this racial stuff that we, that we mm-hmm. dealt with, that we're going through right now with, uh, whether it's, uh, president Obama in the office or whether it's president Trump in the office. Like, I don't like, it's just the racial mm-hmm. tension is ridiculous when, but like, if you go out in the street and you get a job or you meet somebody on the street, no matter what race they are, they're going to be nice people, you know, mm-hmm. they're not, 99% of the time, they're going to be really nice people who want to help, no matter mm-hmm. where you're going, no matter where you go in this country. So it's like, what do you think? Like, being that you work with kids now, being that you're uh, in these institutions, being that you see kids at, at this level, the, the youth at this level, but also being that, you know, we come from the South. We come from a, uh, a state with a, a ra- with a racist history, you know, and mm-hmm. went to a school with a racist history. So, like, how do we, how do we overcome everything, man? That's my whole question. Man. Yeah, no. Now that question is is one I'm not afraid to say I don't have the answer to. Um, but I do know, I do know that um, I do know our grandparents probably wouldn't want us fighting these same battles, right? I do know 
Right. Uh, the folks that came before us probably wouldn't suspect we'd still be dealing with some of the same issues we see as relates to state sanctioned violence and so forth and so on. But I think if you're trying to create or at least start a pathway to systemic change, it's getting people to understand, uh, to, 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 it's getting people to a place uh, of empathy where they can say that, you know, I, I don't walk in your shoes. I might not walk in your shoes, but I, I do want to learn more about where those shoes came from. I do want to learn more about um, the path you've walked, the, the, life, the life you've lived. Um, and I think until we're able to, to get to a place where people are comfortable enough to have those conversations, to disagree in public and not uh, get offended, I think that's really important. But yeah. some people enter the conversation from a place where um, they've already compromised your humanity or they already don't regard you in the same way that they regard themselves. And so when that happens, you can't have an equitable conversation just because people aren't even on the same, they're not, a, you're not being met where you're at. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah. So and yeah, that, I, again, I don't know how to answer to that one, bro, but, but go ahead. I mean, it cuts you off. I mean, no, you it cuts you off though. <laughs> you good. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, and, and that's why I'm glad like, we're we having this conversation because I do, I do my, see myself more leaning more right now as I get older, you know, mm -hmm. leaning more conservative. So, but I still like, feel like I, like, I know I'm not right about everything. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I know like, yeah. you know, so I want to learn. So that's why I'm glad we're having this conversation. I'm hoping that I can learn something from you so that I can, you know, one day tell my kids that, you know, this is, I just want to be able to tell my kids and my grandkids that this is not a racist country. You know what well, I mean? It, I want to be able to tell yeah. my grandkids that this, the country is, uh, you know, it's grown, it's changed, it's, it's better than what it used to be. Even if we still have a yeah. long way to go. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I mean, and I mean, to your point about, to your point about uh, uh, voting in particular, I just, or, or how your political ideology has evolved over time. That's real. Like I said before, we don't give ourselves grace uh, time, time and time again to change our minds. Um, and that's, that's healthy to be able to be in a place to do that. Yeah. I just think we're often backed into a corner uh, when we talk about our democracy, uh, because we've been fooled into believing that there's only two choices for everything. Right. Um, and we don't look at the gradation, the great, the, the gradient in between red and blue, right? Yeah. And we don't yeah. see, uh, aren't often taught to see value and I in think that's the in between. Are, you know, honestly. Yeah. And we find ourselves having to choose from the less, the lesser of two evils a lot of times. Yeah, which right? is terrible, right? And, yes. And on top of that, bro, like we've made access to political power incredibly difficult. Like you have to, it's like, I can't just roll up one day. I'm not 35 yet, but I, when I turn 35, I don't see myself being in a place financially to be like, you know what? I'm gonna drop everything and just run for president. Yeah. You know, higher ed's been fun. Writing books has been good to me, but I'm gonna just run for president. I don't got run for president money, dog. You know what I'm saying? And like, I don't, <laughs> who has run for anything type money, right? Like yeah. there's so much, you have to be able to fund so much of your own, of your own like campaign, right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. and we're just not in a place where the, the system is designed for equitable participation in, in politics or in shaping, reshaping systems. Now, I know that there are some places across the country where there's excellent um, young mayors who have like great constituencies. And I'm thinking of uh, Stockton, California in particular, uh, mm. uh, Michael Tubbs and the great job he's doing out there. Um, he's 29, I want to say, okay. uh, new father, new uh, husband, new father and everything, but he's completely transformed the way Stockton has goes about um, it looks and feels and mm. treats immigrants and you know community police relations like Stockton is like people are looking to that as like a uh, a, a testing ground for new ideas as it relates to politics within municipalities and so mm. I don't know man I just think there needs to be more opportunity so we can have access to to changing those systems but yeah people have just been in the game for a long time bro. That's true. Too long. <laughs> you know what I mean? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Too long. Yeah. If you've been in politics for 30 years, it might be time to just become an advisor and let somebody else say, you know what I mean? Bruh. The fact that never you know what? Never mind. I'm just <laughs> all I'm gonna say is Joe Biden was like the lead person in um the 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 Anita Hill case when they were yeah. trying to confer Clarence Thomas, man. That was yeah. Over there, that was a long time ago. He was old then. Yeah, yeah. You he, feel he me? ran for he ran for president in eighty seven. Yeah, yeah. I was, bro. That's a, I came out the womb. You know, so <laughs> yeah. 
So it's just yeah. like, it's just fascinating to me to know that um, you could be in that in the game for so long, which is you know it it it's great. I'm 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 always excited to uh, to cast my ballot. I'm always excited to exercise my right. I'm always about that life. But I just wish that more folks who are either younger or represent different ideologies or who can push the needle forward in some ways yeah. um we're able to have a space within uh political discourse um yeah yeah but yeah yeah we should be able to vote and say we don't want either one of these candidates we, we need somebody <laughs> else you know what i mean we need you mean kanye better. west oh no i'm just playing <laughs> well, i'm not any of these three <laughs> candidates yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah man yeah cool man so <laughs> So to switch it up a little bit, like, how, what's it like being a dad? You know what I'm saying? Have you thought about? Oh, it's the, cause it's the how, best thing. How old is your daughter? She is four months. She'll be five months in a few days. Okay. Yeah. So it had to be crazy having a baby at the start of COVID. Like, were you able to be in the room and everything? My man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it was only one person, though. So, like, you know, our parents can not come. This was in March. And, like, literally, dog, we went in. People was out and about eating, eating at restaurants and, you know, toasting and turn up, going to brunch and all that. We literally go into the hospital that day. And by the time we left, like two, three days later, every, it was a ghost town. Everything is shut yeah. down. It's when uh, the governor came out and said, you know, no, no more school, no, no anything. So yeah. she was li literally born into a world that we had never seen before. And so, you know, for the most part, like, <laughs> all all of her, her joy's friends are 30 and up <laughs> it's just yeah. me me lauren um you know grandparents come over uh and it's just it's been a fascinating time to become a parent just in in so far as you're trying to figure out this new mm -hmm. i hate the phrase new normal but you're trying to figure out this moment right mm -hmm. while also trying to figure out who you are as you have a dramatic identity shift yeah. um and, you know, I, it took me a while to get back in the swing of things at work. Just to be honest, I, I took paternity leave. Gotcha. So I had that six weeks off after she was born. And then I had to, we were working remote because campus had closed. So I'm like, what am I doing again? And, <laughs> you know, here we are, you know, five months later, and we're about to embark on a new semester. And so it's just, it's just a fascinating time to be, <laughs> to be anything really, yeah. but a new parent, especially, bro, yeah, yeah. just. Uh, that's that's I wasn't. I can't even imagine it, honestly. Yeah, and and were you were y'all like really particular about who, how many people were around your 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 kids when they were first born? No, no. I mean, really? like, yeah, we kind of let our kids free range. <laughs> that's what's up. <laughs> yes, like they, they, you know, they just run around. I try and make them as independent as possible, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm saying so they can go, get their own place and fix their own food and get their own that's water when they need to. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so we have three eight. Just had birthdays in July, so eight, four, and one. Wow, that's a yeah. blessing, bro. Congratulations yeah. to y'all, man. Thank you, man. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's great, man. It's fatherhood. So we had our first one at Chapel Hill, in Chapel Hill Hospital, at UNC. Mm -hmm. uh, the second one we had, and, and the second two we had in Savannah. But So my son was two years old in Chicago, and probably one of the mm -hmm. greatest experiences, like I stayed at home the first two years with my son. Uh, Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it's, it's been cool, man. I mean, in Chicago, they had something called a... Um, the Chicago Dads Meetup or Dads Group. <laughs> yes, Dads yeah. Meetup. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I wasn't taking the that. But it was cool, man. It was like 600 guys. And it just active what? fathers. Yeah. So we would like get free movie tickets. We, they were like, like, yeah, that's people would, like pay for us to have parties and stuff. So it was really cool, actually. Hey, that's what's up, man. Sounds yeah. like a good time. Once all the dust settles, man, we might have to <laughs> relocate or something, man. But that, that, that's fantastic, bro. Yeah. What's, what's been the biggest realization of uh, becoming a dad for you? Uh, that you have the capacity for so much love. I didn't know. I mean, I'm a, an emotional dude, but I write poetry for a living. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I it's never, I was never one to not be, um, to be, af I was never one to be afraid of feelings, but just the, the idea that so much of your happiness, your worry, your hope, your expectations can be tethered to a, to a, a tiny human, right. Yeah. That you co-created with your best friend. Like yeah. it's just, it's just really like we're in a place now where, you know, if this were a normal, again, I hate the word normal, but if we were in a traditional situation, Joy would be getting ready to go to daycare. And mm -hmm. honestly, bro, having had a front row seat to all of her milestones, yeah. I'm, we're not ready to let her out of our sight. And yeah. so I'm just, I think I didn't, I didn't realize um, 
in becoming a father would make you so uh so much so much more uh aware of your feelings and how your feelings and actions impact uh mm. the livelihood of someone else i knew i knew your thoughts and actions impacted others right i, I knew yeah. that but like someone else's livelihood like me forgetting my mask on a trip to the grocery store can have dramatic impacts on the people in my home you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so it's like i i see things almost like a spider sense it's like i see things three steps in the future yeah you um, have to. Mm -hmm. yeah and that's it's almost like superpower man yeah yeah dog uh, oh man bruh sorry my fault man i i fell down the steps one time with joy in my arms and oh, like man. in that in that split second bruh like it's like i grew five more limbs because i like i was holding i was palming her in one hand like a basketball not really but i, you know, I, I had her in yeah. one hand i'm sorry baby i was just playing but i had her in one hand <laughs> and um immediately i like got the other one to wrap around her and then i talked and rolled and like i made it and then she just she was just laughing at me the whole time she thought he was going on a car ride but yeah. like you know it, it's <laughs> just life was in danger <laughs> yes <laughs> but it's like in that moment i was like oh let me do this do this do this do this do this oh she good mm -hmm. meanwhile my back still hurt that was eight, eight months ago <laughs> but it's all good <laughs> yeah 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 the good thing about kids is they bounce back you know, saying yep. a lot, a lot oh, so again. resilient. Yeah, so resilient, man. Me, it take yeah. take two weeks for my knee to feel normal again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, the I guess the biggest realization for me, man, is like that. That's a miracle. Like when your wife has a baby, you guys, you know, decide to have a baby, make love. You know how you do it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, like, and then like nine months later, you're in a hospital, and there's a miracle. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it, yeah. And people have been doing it for centuries since the beginning of humankind without all the yeah. nurses and hospital beds and all this other mm -hmm. crazy stuff. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's just, it's so, it's beautiful, man. It's like a definitely mm -hmm. religious experience in a lot of ways. I remember like mm -hmm. after the, after we had our baby, like I went to the little chapel in UNC hospitals and I, I just cried, you know what I mean? Just like, mm -hmm. just exhausted, oh, yeah, but man. just happy, you know? Tears overflow. I, I mean, I, I think I told you this in the, in the onset or before we started taping that you know we had we had fertility issues right and it was something that we had to wrestle with because it wasn't just it wasn't as simple as we always thought it would be it's like oh you you fall in love you have kids you get married you have kids or sometimes it's the other order right but right yeah. e either way like it's just we thought it would be a lot easier than it actually was and then when we realized you know after um our miscarriages um uh, it was just like, yo, how can we, we know we want to have a family. What do we need to do to make that happen? And so going through the steps of like fertility tests and treatments and IVF just in general, and just realizing that it took, uh, for us, it took so much just to have her here that it just makes her existence that much more meaningful for us just because we knew we, I mean, honestly, man, we do it again a thousand times over, I think, just because yeah. she just, she's just such a light, man. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm just grateful every single day, dog. Yeah. Yeah. Fatherhood is beautiful. And I think that's something that's changed sure. as well. I think, you know, the generation before us and the generation before them, you know, are kind of known as like Debbie dads a lot. But I think mm -hmm. men in our generation are changing that. You know, it's mm -hmm. the idea of like, you know, uh, this basically the story is like it was two twins. They both had an alcoholic father. One twin became an alcoholic, and he said it's because my dad was an alcoholic. One, one guy never drank, became, you know, never drank. And he said it's because my dad was an alcoholic. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So it's mm -hmm. like, you know, we are, as our generation of, of men are choosing to be there for our kids a lot more than uh, generations before us. And I, yeah. I, I think that's changing, which is a great thing. Man, I'm going to do it. I, I, I don't even, I almost don't want to mention it because I don't know where I saw it. But there's like this viral video of a, of a brother like hugging his daughter as they walk down the street and he's just talking about mm -hmm. how in love with her he is and mm -hmm. you know how his life has changed and how you have to make room in your heart for new emotions to feel things that I you didn't it, know yeah, yeah you, you you feel me and, and it's just like man it's like yo that captured that's 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 it yeah. that's it right there that's that that's the video i, I think um yeah something i think about uh, a lot more these days obviously but uh it's something I say with uh, an air of gratitude on my breath, for sure. Mm. Mm. Well, beautiful, man. I, I thank you for coming on, man. Right, we'll go yeah, no, up. thanks for thanks for carving out a space, bro. No, man, thank you. Uh, so 
everybody out there listening, to Donovan Livingston, I got one more question to ask you, so don't, don't hang up on me. All right, man. But like, we yeah, got, yeah. Uh, he has Molasses out, his new album. Uh, you can find it on Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, Google Play, anywhere else you want to. Uh, he has a tremendous book, Lift Off. Uh, you can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books of a Million, Target. At least, that's, at least that's what your website said. So you can find <laughs> yeah, it in yeah. those places. You can find uh, it everywhere, man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tremendous, tremendous guy. Tremendous story. Um, so Thanks. Uh, last question. Uh, if you had a superpower or ability, what would you choose or why? I'd be a dad, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was like we, we just spent, you know, the past 10 minutes talking about it. But it, as I reflect, like, that's it. Yeah. I'd like, you know, and, and uh, there's a lot that comes with that. But I think. By the superpower of being, you know, creating room in my heart to love another human. And I think that's the greatest power any of us could ever have. Mm -hmm. So dad life, man. Um, I will say uh, thank you for uh, mentioning those projects and, and shouting them out. Uh, another project that uh, my wife and I have together, it's called The Doctor's Livingston. It's okay. a blog uh, that really captures a lot of our experiences, um, uh, not just as, as parents and partners, but uh uh, captures our experiences in graduate school, um, as well as uh, some of our hobbies. So Lauren is an expert crafts person. She like builds stuff. Like when I say build stuff, bro, she goes in, she <laughs> built like a cabana for our backyard type oh, stuff, man. Yeah. So this ain't, ain't no baby <laughs> projects, bro. She out here doing the thing. So, um, you know, we, we she's talking about woodworking. I'm talking about music and poetry. And it's just a, a space for us to sort of share to let people in a bit more. People yeah. ask us questions about stuff all the time. And so this is a place where all of those quasi answers live. But, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I just want, want you to know the Doctors Livingston is live and it's out there um, across all social media platforms too. But download Molasses, check it out, listen to it. So it's, it's a good vibe. I think it's a vibe for this historical moment we're in. Yeah. And uh, just really grateful to be able to, to speak truth to power, man. And yeah. to speak to you specifically. <laughs> <laughs> hey, anytime, man. I'd I love to have you back uh, in the future whenever you get, you know what I'm saying, another project going on. Uh, real quick, sure. a, a, great, uh, a great gift for your wife then. Uh, I've just been redoing my deck, and I have mm -hmm. a cordless saw. This is battery powered and a cordless impact oh, yeah. drill. Those are okay. awesome, man. Yeah, just cordless like cordless, saw impact. Yeah, 18-volt eight, eight cordless saw, 18-volt bolt impact drill. You can pretty much build a house with those. Uh, all right and they'll, hey don't don't tempt her with a good time bro she she about that life <laughs> <laughs> all right everybody out there listening thank you for watching thank you for listening uh this is raz with the raz cast as always uh be the change you want to see in the world you don't have to have a billion dollars to make a difference you just gotta go down the road and tell somebody you love them so i love you guys and i will talk to you next time peace